there was a lady who came of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had come up that had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you've kept the good wine until now. And Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in the kingdom of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> Interesting story this morning. Nonetheless, uh, I want to share with you something concerning uh, miracles or a miracle. Miracles happen everywhere around us. Can someone say amen? amen. <clears throat> Many a time we get so caught up with life and things happening that we don't pay close attention to these miracles. Miracles are different. Not one miracle is the same as the other. God is at work continuously all around us, church. Can someone say amen? amen. Over the past few months, I found myself encouraging the church more and more so on the, on the basis of keep your focus on Christ. Keep your focus on God. Keep focus on what he's doing around us and, and the work of God in us. It's so easy for us to get distracted uh, the different things that happen in life. This life is very interesting. Can someone say amen with me? It is a blessing. It is amazing. But it is definitely interesting and at times very, very challenging. Uh, many of us uh, have gone through losses uh, we, there's so many things that, that, that happen on a daily basis, illnesses, all sorts of things that happen to us. As a matter of fact, if you find, if you see me walking a little slow, it's one of those things this morning, right? And I was going to say, don't know what the reason is, but I think Mary it is that because maybe I'm getting a little older, I'm not going to that. <laughs> I was going to blame it on something else, right? But, uh, and it happens on occasion, you know, where I'm, I feel my bones aching, my lower back, and so if you, uh, that's happening this morning, like, just walking slowly. Right? But God is at work no matter what. Amen, church. Don't ever forget that. Ever, don't ever, I mean, if I can drive that home continuously in your spirit and your mind, do not ever forget that God is at work no matter what is happening around us in the world or even in our own lives. It may seem bleak, it may seem dark, it may seem... Uh, like it, it, it's hopeless and there is no hope, but I tell you that God is still at work in the midst of whatever we find ourselves in. Amen. Amen. And uh, an individual writes this concerning miracles. Uh, it's called, it comes from the Sunday School Times. It says, in a recent number of the Sunday School Times, a story is told of an Eastern king which illustrates at once our delusion respecting natural processes and also God's work and presence in them. The king was sit, seated in a garden, and one of his counselors was speaking of the wonderful works of God. Show me a sign, said the king, and I will believe. Here are four acorns, said the counselor. Will you, majesty, plant them in the ground, and then stoop down for a moment and look into this clear pool of water? The king did so. Now, said the other, look up. The king looked up and saw four oak trees where he had planted the acorns. Wonderful! He exclaimed, this is indeed the work of God. How long were you looking into the water? Asked the counselor. Only a second, said the king. Eighty years have passed as a second, said the other. The king looked at his garments. They were red bare. He looked at his reflection in the water. He had become an old man. There is no miracle here, then, he said angrily. Yes, said the other. It is God's work, whether he did it in one second or in eighty years. God continues to work and continues to work. Amen. Leads me to another uh, song. I, I love songs, and I find God speaking to me in different ways. Uh, the writers, Casey uh, Bethard and Chris Wallman, write a song 
that Ken Lucchesi made famous, Don't Blink. I don't know if you've ever heard it, it's, it's a few years old. It's an amazing song, amazing story concerning uh, one of the individual who reached about 100 years old or 102 years old, the song says. And uh, they, the newscast comes to him and asks him, What's the secret to life? Uh, he looks out at him, the song says, There's old pipe. And he says, Don't blink. Don't blink. <clears throat> and he goes on through the whole story, you get a chance to listen to it. But whatever the case, whatever uh, has happened or is happening or will happen, nothing changes who God is. Can someone say amen? And that there are miracles that continue to happen even as we continue to age, even as changes happen around us. Nothing changes who God is, church. I rest well at night, Richard, as I think uh, about who God is, that no matter what our divisions or no matter what our struggles, no matter what the world sees, even if the world fell apart and was split in two, it does not change who God is. It does not change his love for you and for me and for everyone else in the world for that matter. God cannot be changed and he cannot be moved unless it is his will to do so. Right. So there are miracles that continue to happen in the setting. In the story here, there are four things that I want us to consider. One, the setting, right? Uh, the other is a need. Three, a miracle that happens within that need. And then the response to that miracle. Four things. Those four things are always working around us when you think about it, because there's always something that God is doing, because the setting is just right for that. Amen. And we may not realize it, acknowledge it at the moment when we're going through whatever we're going through or whatever stress we're, uh, uh, we're going through, whatever is happening, but that is the same. Amen. And in our case, we ought to celebrate all the more so, church. When we see things that are, that, are, that, are, that are not in accordance with how we believe it should be, maybe God is doing something. He's up to something. Can someone say amen with me? If we don't uh, like what we see or what we hear, we don't agree with the world around us, Right, but God is still at work. Don't get caught up in, in, that, in that point of thought, you know, thinking that, well, things are not right. Things are not like they should be. Well, things are never going to be like they should be in accordance to our human nature. Right. I mean, we, we, think about it. You know, this, this blink that we've encountered along the way, right, how many times have we said, well, that's not right? Or how many times have we disagreed with something or the world around us, but yet it does not change on who God is. Amen. And it does not change what he's called us to do for that matter. The setting is right. The setting is right for that matter, church. The setting is perfect. The, the darker the situation is in your life or in the life of the church or in the world around us, the better the setting for God. Amen. Think about it. What's, what has moved God in the past? Has it been when things are perfect and everything is well and everyone is happy? No doubt God rejoices to see his people enjoying life and enjoying his blessings, no doubt. But we see God continuously moving through history at the darkest of times. When people choose not to give up, when people choose to acknowledge who he is in the midst of that setting. So we have the setting established in verses 1 and 2. On the third day... His wedding in Cana, Gal Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Oh, by the way, consequently, she just happened to be there. It's interesting because as I read this story in the scriptures, you know, Mary is up to something. We don't really know what it is. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. It says that when the wine gave out, the mother said to Jesus, there's no wine. And that's pretty interesting as well, morning. When I think about that, I was like, well, you know, Jesus replies correctly. Uh, and, and although Richard, Jesus does not address her as mother or mom, you know, he wasn't being disrespectful or rude. That's just the way in his time how they would communicate. So um, what concern is that to you and me? In other words, what are you saying? The wedding plan is messed up. That's not you, your thing or my thing. Just let it go. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not his mother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, but there's something going on with Mary as well that we don't we don't really see. I mean, I always like to read between the lines, and sometimes that's dangerous because we may read into something that's not. Right? So I'm careful to, to not do that this morning. But obviously, something is happening between Mary and Jesus. And Mary's like, "There's no more wine," you know, and probably looks to Jesus 
And Jesus addresses her. The writer of John is very intentional with what, the way he writes things. Because instead of Pam, uh, making that connection of son and mother, uh, there's kind of a separation there. And there's a good reason for that. A good reason for that. Because here, things are starting to get set up for what's about to take place in the future concerning his crucifixion. That setting's already started to take place. Well, what concern is that to you and me? Should be concerned over that. He says, right here, my hour has not yet come. That statement right there sets for what, 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 what's about to happen in the future concerning Jesus' crucifixion. Right? So John is being intentional with what he places in there. And there's things going on with Mary and Jesus as well. And, uh, and Jesus, you know, it's interesting because as I, as I read the, the, the scripture and I read the story, you know, <coughs> Jesus is like, you know, just let it, let it go. It, I mean, it's okay. Right? But Mary seems to have a plan. Are you with me? Let me tell you why. Because she doesn't address Jesus in reply and reply. What she does is she addresses the servants. And she, like, she, continue, she just totally ignores Jesus. Turns to the servants and says, just do whatever he says. Do you see it? It's interesting in that whole process because, you know, Mary, who knows what Mary had seen previously? She knew and understood who Jesus really was, but who knows what she'd seen that we've not yet, and may not ever know what she saw. Maybe she saw Jesus creating miracles, other miracles. But in this story, it's the first account of his miracle. It's the first account of something glorious happening. It's the first account of the world being uh, being told that a Savior that, that, is, that is around them has come and is there with them. Right? It's the first account of that story. It's the first miracle. The miracle is, the, the, the miracle is not the focus, church. We tend in our human nature to focus on the miracle first and only and we bypass where the miracle comes from. Amen. We tend to get pretty excited when we hear about a miracle. There's something miraculous happening. And we celebrate that, and we rightfully should. But let's not forget where the miracle comes from. Right? And so here, uh, Mary tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. And I can almost hear it in her tone of voice. This completely ignores Jesus what he says. Do whatever he says. She's expecting something to happen. Are you with me, church? Listen, how many times have we come to, to worship in our worship services with, with an attitude like, nothing's going to happen? I'm preaching this morning, by the way. <laughs> how many times have we gone to church because it's just the thing we do, but we're not really, we're not really stretching or uh, waiting on God to do something in the midst of our worship? How many times have we left church dry just like we walked in? How many times have we not allowed God's presence to bless us, to touch us, because of our attitude and our mindset of, well, it's the same old thing, the same old thing. Come on, you're too quiet on me. What's, what's happening? <laughs> we do that. That's part of our human nature sometimes. We, we, we get tired of being we get frustrated or things happen. We, we lose out of the blessing, church. And I'm here to tell you this morning, that if you and I put in our spirits and our minds in prayer an attitude of expectancy, you will get what you're expecting from God. Amen. And I want to encourage you this morning to do so. The Bible says that as a person thinketh, so are they. As if a person thinks that it's it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing, it's not going to work out, nothing's going to happen, nothing good is going to come out of that, well, that's exactly what the person is going to get. Amen. And I'm here to tell you this morning, in the name of Christ Jesus, we're not going to allow that thought process in the midst of this church. Amen. We're going to have a thought process that glorifies God, that glorifies Christ. Can someone say amen with me? That is standing in the scriptures, that allows God's anointing to move on our lives, that our worship will become even more alive, and our, our, our witness becomes fruitful in the name of Christ Jesus. In spite of whatever happens in this world, you and I are called to Christ. Amen. 
And there's those miracles. There's those are the places where miracles take place. Mary doesn't address Jesus, doesn't get in conversation with him concerning what the need is. She knows, she beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus is capable of taking care of the situation. And if I don't say another word, that will preach. <laughs> Amen. Jesus is capable of taking care of the situation, whatever the situation may be, church. He's capable, and he has a plan. Whatever that plan is, we may not fully understand it or not, but he has a plan, and he's capable. And you and I are called to put our faith on him and only him, church, because if you and I put our faith in our sight on everything that's around us, guess what? Everything is going to fall apart eventually. Amen. Sorry to say <clears throat> Everything is going to fall apart eventually. Our last breath. Will we take anything with us? No, we will not. These things, will this building be here two or three hundred years from now or this world still is in existence? Oh, no. The Bible says who God is will never change. Lifetimes will come and go, Richard, but God will continue being God no matter what. The rest assured, St. Matthew, that if you place your faith in God and serve Him with an attitude of expectancy, it will never be a dull or dry moment in your life with Christ. It will be an exciting one for that matter. Mary is expecting Jesus to, to do something. He's expecting Jesus to work the situation. She doesn't really understand how, but she's like, just do whatever he says. Not far from there were six stone water jars that were used for Jewish ritual cleansing, purification. And the thought was that the reason why they, why they were stoned was because it would keep the water pure. And, and then they would utilize the water to either cleanse their hands or you know, purify utensils or what have you. And it's interesting what Jesus uses for that matter. Right? He uses these these jars, you know, that that would uh, that would hold 20 or 30 gallons for that matter. I don't want to focus too much on the number. There were six of them. Some preacher would focus on you know, six minus, you know, seven minus one, you know, the seven being the perfect number of God will have. It's not what I want to do this morning. I want to focus on what was inside those containers. Six of them that would hold 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus tells the servants, tells them, fill them up to the brim. Fill them up to the brim. When you as I thought about the whole story again, as I always do when I get into my, my studies, like, I wonder what they thought when Jesus tells them, fill them up to the brim. I wonder if they were maybe complaining. I wonder if maybe they were worn out and tired. Come on. I wonder if they just like, you know, just do what she said. You know, Mary told them, just do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Whatever the case, they were obedient. And we don't know what's happening in their minds or what they're saying, but they fill all six of those jars up to the brim. And then Jesus tells them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. And when they did, he was amazed. That was not water, because he didn't know what was happening. He was the lonely servant that knew what was happening. But when he drinks that wine, his statement is to the right and oh, you were holding on on us. You saved the best for last. Isn't it amazing the way God works, church? Isn't it amazing the way Jesus is at work? Now, that when we think that, that the best happened years ago, when we think that the best happened, you know, just you know, maybe a few years ago, maybe in the inception of our journey and our faith journey with Christ, or the inception of the church. That isn't it amazing that God says, no, that's not the best yet. The best is yet to come. St. Matthew, I'm here to encourage you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to tell you the best is yet to come. You may not feel like it at times. 
It may not seem that way at times, but I'm here to tell you the best is yet to come. We are living in exciting, exciting times. You know, we may think, well, it doesn't seem like it's too exciting because it seems like everything is falling apart. Well, it's exciting only because that's when God shows up the most. When things are falling apart. And when you and I let God be God in the midst of that brokenness or in the midst of that darkness, in the midst of that loss, God will definitely show up somehow in his grace and his mercy to remind us of his love and remind us who he is to us. Can someone say amen with me? <coughs> when the steward tastes the water that become wine, you know where it came from. So we called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves a good wine first, and then fear of wine to the guests that have become drunk. But you kept the good wine until now. The key word is now. John is being intentional in his wording. The word now is facing an intention. Because that was John's way of letting everyone know that Jesus was now walking in the fullness of who he was and he is now. Jesus is working right now, church. He is. If you allow him to be, he will be Lord of all. If you do not, he's limited. Not because he's powerless, but because you don't allow him to be. Verse 11, the very last verse. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in the kingdom of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. How are people going to believe that Jesus is Jesus when they see his glory in your life and in my life? How's that? What does that mean? I've always asked, what does that mean? When Stephen was being stoned in the scriptures, he said he, he, he fell on his knees and they continued to stone him. Donna, the scripture said that he looked up and he saw God's glory. Many places in scripture state, make statements of seeing God's glory. What is God's glory in your life? What is God working in your life? What does that mean? God definitely is in his glory in your life right now. Think about it. We woke up this morning. Praise God for his glory. <clears throat> We're able to walk in here, whether slow or whether fast. Praise God for his glory. In spite of our week this past week or what difficulties we might have encountered along the way, we're here glorifying his name. Thank him for his glory. Every breath you're able to take while you sit here listening to me this morning, thank him for his glory. The fact that we're able to move around, and even if we didn't, thank him for his glory. The fact that that we continue to give him his place in our lives. Thank him for his glory, church. That's his glory. <coughs> and his work in the midst of us. Amazing when you think about it. Oh, I don't know about you, but I'm hoping I can walk out here a little quicker because I'm excited for the scriptures and his promises, church. Amazing. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. How will the world believe when they see God's glory in your life and in my life? Words are cheap. Amen? Amen. Words are cheap. It's when they see Jesus in your life without seeing words that people really start to believe. And when they see our actions, who God is in us, then people to believe on Jesus Christ as the Son of God. 
Saint Matthew, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to continue strong in your faith. Continue holding on to God's word and continue holding on to his grace and his power and his love. Because in spite of whatever things happen in the future, something's always going to happen. Anybody, are you with me? Something's always going to happen you know, that we probably aren't intuitively agreeing with. At some point, God will call us home. Another thing will happen. So between now and then, continue to focus on God. Continue glorifying Him for the miracles that He's given you in your life. The miracles of, of movement, of life, and of the blessings that He continues to give us to be able to get up and about, to, to, to glorify Him, to think on Him, to talk to Him, to pray to Him, to worship Him. All these are miracles that are happening, church. Continue to glorify Him. This is the Word of God for the people of God.